If you've ever used AWS at all, you were asked what region you wanted to use when you launched a resource, whether that resource was an EC2 instance, database, Lambda function, or something else. And on the surface, it seems like a straightforward question, and you may have picked a region that was either close to you or close to your customers. It also seems like a good way to geologically distribute your application using AWS. In this video, we're gonna dive deep into exactly what a region is, what factors should influence your decision, and if using multiple regions is really the golden ticket that you think it is. Hey, what's up? I'm Will Button, and this is DevOps for Developers, where I help you build DevOps skills to either boost your career as a software engineer or specialize as an engineer in DevOps. In AWS, regions are as straightforward as they sound. It's the part of the planet where the servers hosting your applications physically reside. Even if you're building a serverless application, there is a server powering your application that you don't know about. In AWS, region is actually a logical group of physical data centers located in a specific part of the world. Now, some cloud providers define a region as a physical data center, but for AWS, each region consists of three or more availability zones. And an availability zone is one or more physical data centers connected by low latency, highly redundant fiber. One way to think of this is if you think of a region as a small city, the availability zones would be the subdivisions within that city. This is an important concept and we're gonna come back to it later in this video. Now, an availability zone has to meet certain constraints. It must be physically separated from the other availability zones in that region by a meaningful distance, like a couple miles, but not more than 60 miles. It has to have independent power, cooling, and physical security, and each one is built with a goal of ensuring that local disasters such as earthquakes, fires, tornadoes, or power outages won't affect multiple availability zones. The final criteria is that all traffic between availability zones is always encrypted. So now the big question, which region should you use? As long as you pick a region that is geographically close to your users, you really can't pick a bad region. US East 1 is the most popular region in AWS because it used to be the default. Plus for a long time, it was the one that got the new features first. One thing to consider before choosing is which AWS services you're gonna be using. Not all services are available in all regions, so if you're planning on using something like AWS Control Tower, which you should be using, you'll need to avoid using US West 1 because it's not available there. Finally, let's talk about the big elephant in the room, using multiple regions. A lot of people I talk to want to implement multiple regions as a form of high availability plus reduced latency for their customers. Look, I'm not trying to crush your hopes and dreams here, but in all likelihood, you'll accomplish neither of those. But I'm also gonna tell you why, and I'm gonna tell you how you can accomplish that with far less effort and cheaper. So let's break this up into two parts because it's really two different problems. High availability, let's define what it means first. It means having multiple servers available to respond to requests so that if one stops responding, other servers are available to pick up the requests and continue delivering your content. So it's tempting to think that spreading your application across multiple regions will give you high availability, and technically it will. But let's go back to what I was talking about earlier when I gave you the definitions of regions and availability zones. An availability zone is a physically isolated data center belonging to a single region connected by redundant low latency fiber. So if you spread your application across multiple availability zones within a region, you get the highly available fault tolerant design you were looking for without having to deal with the network latency introduced by communicating across regions. The other reason I hear for multi-region deployments is reduced latency, and it usually goes something like this. Well, our website's hosted in US East 1, but the performance sucks for Asia, so clearly we need to host it in multiple regions. Well, LittleData.io surveyed 5,800 sites in September of 2022, and they found that the average latency was 456 milliseconds. That's worth noting for two different reasons. Number one, I've never talked to anyone about this problem 
who was anywhere close to 456 milliseconds for their response time. Number two, if your response time is 456 milliseconds or better, you and I probably aren't having this conversation. I mean, sure, a faster site would be great, but it's probably not really high on your priority list. Let's do a little math here to make my point clear. I'm gonna assume that if latency is on your priority list, your site is one of the poor performers, meaning you have a latency of 800 milliseconds or higher. So the backbone latency from New York to Singapore is 200 milliseconds just due to the speed of light. So if you eliminate that completely, you still have a 600 millisecond response time, which still leaves you as one of the worst performing sites on the internet. Your time would honestly be better spent figuring out what's going on in your application layer that's making your site so slow, which is also something that you can control because it's either code that can be refactored, databases that can be optimized, or static assets that can be offloaded to CDN. All of those will produce results that not only improve the performance of your site for your users in Asia, but also the performance for users accessing your site from right next door. And finally, let's talk about the hidden cost of multi-region availability. To do it right, you need a complete set of your application services in multiple regions. And each of those needs to be highly available and fault tolerant. So now you've doubled your operating costs at a bare minimum. But there's more. Now you have data in both locations. So if a user in Asia performs an action that involves the database, such as making a purchase or updating their profile or booking an event, you not only have to synchronize that data back to the other region, you also have to check to make sure that none of your website users in that other region took an action that should have conflicted with the action taken by the user in Asia. And that, my friends, is a shitload of overhead. And for 99% of the businesses I talk to, it's not one they're prepared to deal with, nor is it the actual root cause of their issue. So back to the title of this video, what is US East 1? It's a region consisting of multiple availability zones, and hopefully those terms make a lot more sense to you now. And this video has been helpful for you in understanding how to utilize AWS to architect well-designed applications. If you're interested in learning more about building applications using DevOps principles, check out my DevOps Roadmap. It's a choose your own adventure guide that lets you identify what you already know and see how that ties into the other DevOps practices to create your own customized DevOps roadmap. There's a link in the description below. And thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.